uh, we changed things up a little bit today, and it confused everybody, uh, including me. So, uh, if you're in here and you're part of our children's worship time, you may want to go. You want to go ahead, Miss Kathy's at the back there, um, and go ahead and uh, make your hook up there. We have been doing this series called Love, Marriage, and Other Mushy Stuff, and um, we're wrapping it up today. And uh, I remember a story, it goes, uh, it was at the end of the service, and uh, this old lady was sort of leaving the church, and the pastor was at the back of the church shaking hands, and and uh, the, the little old lady said in a sweet little voice, she said, you know what, pastor, I didn't get hardly anything out of your message. But that testimony that lady gave really touched my heart and it's so true you know why testimonies touch our heart is because they put skin on what we hear it's one thing for me to get up and to tell you what God's word says about a verse or to tell you a story and sort of illustrate that story or whatever but when you hear skin put on that verse or skin put on that story it takes it to a whole nother level of understanding for us and so what I wanted to do as we wrapped up this love series is put skin on on it. I wanted you to hear from real people about real issues, real questions about love in their marriage, in their family, at their job, those kinds of things, and put skin on it. And so I've asked uh, several people to come. Benny and Cindy Collier are going to come, and there's your seats. And uh, Scott and Tammy Godman are right there. Your seats are over there. And Jeff and Heather Sayers are coming, and you're right in the middle. And I'm going to do sort of an Oprah type of thing, okay? I may end up being like Dr. Phil. You know, there's a difference in Oprah and Dr. Phil. I mean, Oprah's all nice, but if you watch Dr. Phil, he may go, you idiot, what are you thinking? And uh, so I want to just uh, take a few minutes and interview uh, these couples about love um, in the different aspects. And um, I'm going to sit right here bet- between my security team. And um, and I just want to interview you guys. Mr. Benny, Miss Cindy, go ahead and introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, um, Into the microphone. <laughs> just me or us? Both of you. Oh, together. Benny and Cindy Collier, and we will celebrate our 37th anniversary in May. No, I won't. How many kids? How many grandkids? We know you're proud of them. We have four children, uh, two grandchildren, and one on the way in July. Okay. And um, this is odd. <laughs> uh, okay. Jeff and Heather, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Jeff and Heather Sands. And it's real bright up here. Yeah. Um, we have three kids, Carly and Josh. Carly's our youngest and Josh is our middle. And then we have an oldest boy. He's 15. He's right there. <laughs> I teach and she stays at home. We run a little uh, home-based business. And we've been married for... 16 years. Wow. 16 years in uh, a couple weeks. Oh, okay, good. Good deal. Scott, Tammy? <laughs> we are Scott and Tammy Gottman. I don't know if that's working or not, so I might not just... Hold it up there until they get it working. Um, we have two children, Kylie and Elizabeth, five and eight. Tammy is an assistant principal here at Perry, and I am a program manager for the Office of Personnel Management, which is a government entity out of Macon. Okay, good deal. I will start with Benny and Cindy. Let me just ask you guys some questions. Uh, can you describe to us what love looked like in your marriage? And this is sort of funny because I didn't know how long you'd been married, so I put in my notes 20 years ago. Uh, so 37 years ago, uh, what did love look like uh, when you guys, in your early in your marriage? I was just out of high school. I graduated in May, met her that summer at the ball field, and just love. You know? <laughs> it was it was uh, physical at first. I was you know long hair, shorts, loud car. Her or you? Me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, she was she was beautiful. She was just 14 years old. Uh, and, and this is what you don't do. <laughs> I mean, I could talk for hours probably, but but um, I hunted her, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't date her, so we just had her 
phone relationship and met when we could. And eventually it got to be, I had to go to church to meet him. So uh, that was my early days at church, uh, just, just to see Cindy. Uh, and, and of course there was no God, you know, in it that much, but um, <laughs> she, she, was, she had a relationship, I think, but I didn't. I just went, you know, for uh, her. And then, um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I was dedicated to her. I had never really had a girlfriend in high school. I was just, you know, cars and hunting fishing. Uh, and she changed my life. Wow. Told, showed me what really, you know, what relationship should be. I stuck with her. How about how about early in your marriage when you guys actually got married? How, how about early in your marriage? What 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 was love like? Uh, <laughs> it was strange because neither one of us knew what we were doing. Uh-huh. <laughs> we. Uh, I think I'm embarrassed. I, I still carry on with my hunting, and fishing, and, and car, and she was left alone a lot, and it was tough on her. Mm. Me, I carried right on, you know. But then it started tearing on me. It wasn't until I got saved in, in 88 that I really realized what, you know, a, a mate was. Wow. Now, I learned, I had some really, really great role models at the church we were going to. Mm. And they showed me what a real man should be like before treatment of life. Now, how has that love grown and changed over these 37 years, present day, 2013? Well, when you're 14 and you see this really cute guy, you know, it's, it's just... I wish I had a picture of that. If I'd known, if I'd known that was going to be part of the story, I would have had a picture. But um, it, 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 there, isn't, there isn't love, but I'm, I did look at him. I think that it was a... a I think Benny was truly the man God wanted me to have, but but it did not come without a lot of um, turmoil. But uh, I did not have um, my mom and my real dad were still married, and and um, every time they had a fight, uh, which was quite often, the word divorce was always brought up. Uh-huh. And so um, when we got married. Um, I, I had to only have been 14 and you set your sights on a 17 year old guy and then you wait and so as the years you know the sitting in class going Mrs. Benny B. Collier Jr. <laughs> how will I sign my name one day but so when we finally did get married um, the night on, on the white horse that was taking me away from a lot of turmoil, I thought that we were going to take the trash out together and that we were going to, you know, pay our bills and so and have, you know, a wonderful picnic afterwards. And we were going to, you know, I just didn't have a clue because I thought that everything that my parents did then apparently had to be totally different. So when we, when we got married, um, and his life no longer centered around me. One of the one of the things that he said to me that just devastated me was, "You've got to find a hobby because I'm not it." Uh. And um, because I just my whole world had revolved around him, and so I was so disillusioned. And so, what did our lo- what did my love look like? Probably like mud bogging. Yeah. Um, if I didn't get my way, I was so selfish. If I didn't get my way, I screamed and hollered and called him back and he didn't talk and, you know, withheld things and just did all kinds of, you know, selfish things that you do. And it was uh, six years. It was six long years. And um, mm. we began to to go to church and, and I just started doing a study on love and I realized if this is love, then he's getting the very short end of the stick because mm. it was bad <laughs> on my part. Well, what about today, 2013? He's the love of my life. Yeah, I mean, honestly, 37 years later, and I'm more in love with her now than ever before. Uh, That's good. We spend every moment that we can together. And my priorities have changed. Well, the hair's shorter and the pants are longer. So that's good. Awesome.
me. Awesome. Jeff and Heather, uh, you guys have three kids. You talked about a minute ago. Um, I know you're busy, teacher. Y'all have your home-based business that you work. Uh, busy life. How, how does love, what does love look like in your home? Uh, you know, I kind of learned a long time ago that we had, we had a pastor in America that said love is spelled T-I-M-E. Uh. Um, and that's probably where we fail at, you know, sometimes because we are fairly busy and finding time to spend with, you know, especially with kids. Of course, we hang around the house, you know, but <laughs> and sometimes that's not spending time with them. Um, so we do things as far as, uh, you know, last night I took my little boy to a movie. Uh, Carly wanted me to come eat with her. Um, at school one day, and I just couldn't do it, so I said, I'll tell you what, we'll go out and get some yogurt tonight. Little things like that that we try to do to tell him, you know, I want to spend time with you. Uh, I go work out with him, um, which is good and bad. It makes me feel old because he passed me pretty quick. Uh, that's what he can do and what I can do. Um, and then with us, now we do go out. Uh, we spend time going out to eat and, and you know, going to a movie or, or, or things like that. Um, so, as far as time-wise is concerned, we try to spend time with each other, uh, just to let them know I want to be around you, I want to be with you. Uh, we are fairly affectionate. Um, you know, I try to love on the kids a little bit, try to give a 15-year-old a hug, you know how that is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, we try to share love like that. Um, of course, we tell each other we love them, you know. A lot. Cool. Um, how how do you reinforce the word love at your house? And, and you just sort of alluded to a couple of ways, but. Um, uh. Well, I think we like to have fun and have a good time together. Um, I know Caleb isn't a big fan of you know he's fifteen and wants to do his own thing. Carly, on the other hand, you know she's nine, so she's always wanting to cuddle, have fun, and, um, and then Josh is 11, so he's kind of fighting the growing up and, um, and yet still being a kid and stuff, so, but we like to have a lot of fun together, we like, I know it sounds corny, but we've always kind of tickled and wrestled and um, stuff like that. Are you ticklish? One thing that I, I think about is, um, I've always wanted my, my family to know that I love them, I mean, I want them to know that I love them. We fail a lot of time, you know, I can, I'm pretty hot-headed sometimes, you know, so I can yell and I can get angry and I can do those things. Um, I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am, so, for those who don't know me, I am too. So, so, and I learned a long time ago that, I said a long time ago, I'm not that old. Um, I learned that I, when I make a mistake, I want to go, I, I I need to apologize for her. And I do that with my kids. And I do that with her. Um, don't apologize for her. Because I want them to know when I make a mistake, I'm willing to admit to them. Um, now, I apologize for yelling or getting angry. I don't apologize for discipline. You know, and, and, and try to reinforce that. Because I, I want them to feel and sense that we love them. And we love each other. Because there's a safety there. Yeah. And, and I like that safety. And I, I, you know, I think it's important. Cool. A sense of love. In our home. Good deal. Scott and Tammy, um, we, we've talked a lot in this series about, I've used the phrase a lot, in your marriage, in your home. And I keep using the phrase, in your workplace. Um, what does love look like in your workplace? <laughs> Our stories aren't nearly as interesting as theirs because work is different, as we all know. Um, but it's not, actually, as I've kind of reflected on these questions yesterday, thinking about this, you know, love should be the same at work as it is at home. I may not run around to all our faculty and staff and say, oh, I love you, love you, love you, although I do. I've told several people this week that I love them, and they have actually loved They should be speaking this week about me versus me speaking about them because they have shown lots of love. Huh. Testing season is here, if uh. you know that. So, um, 
I think with in the workplace, they just it's a matter of servanthood. You know, where you're the administrator, you're the boss, or whatever your role is, or even in education as the teacher. Um, it's just that you show love, even when there's the good times and the bad times with your own personal life and professional life. Um, you just always need to show love. You know, I, I tease Scott all the time that if I could just go in and follow my job description, I could get home and, you know, I could have it all together. But unfortunately or fortunately, um, it doesn't work that way because you have teachers in the office, they cry because, you know, their child is having this issue or in their own classroom, there's this problem or just what you know, life, life happens and it happens to everybody at work. Um, so my prayer every morning during our silent time is just give me the words, the wisdom, and the actions to show you your love. That truly is my prayer every day during the silent time. Cool. And in case anybody didn't know, she keeps looking over at Cindy because they work together. Right, yeah. <laughs> she should be talking about this with me. Oh, I thought you were going to say something there. Well, I, and I ask you guys... I, I, worked, um, I worked 12 hours yesterday... Uh, on a Saturday. I don't normally work on a Saturday, so love isn't real high on the scale <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, I, I ask you guys specifically because both of you are in sort of supervisory roles at your jobs. And, and as most of us know, supervisors, you may love them or you may hate them. And so my question for you guys was, as a supervisor, it's almost like a parent a lot of times, H- how, does, how does love come out uh, when you're dealing with either you, you know your peers or even those that you are the boss of, and it's funny. I wish I could have a dime for every time that I say I am a manager over developers. And if anybody knows anything about computer people and software developers, it's kind of a quirky <laughs> career to be in. People are either very mature or not very mature. And I've said a million times, raising a development team is like raising children, except for I can't spank them. (laughs) So, you know, just as Tammy has teachers coming to her with their personal problems, I have to deal with a lot of interpersonal conflict amongst my team. And I have, you know, where I work, I have an open door policy. You can come to me. I, I speak to you in confidence. If you have something you want to share with me. But I also tell them, you know, I'm doing that because I love you as an individual. And... I know the guys in my group, you know, they all get kind of squirmy when I tell them that. But I want them to know that, yes, I'm your boss and you have to do what I say, but I'm also willing to listen. And if you have a problem or you have another problem or problem with another person in our group, that, you know, come to me with that problem. Don't try to to hold it in or, or not deal with it. So you'd be surprised at how much of that time I spend doing every day. I mean, it's not something that's just once a week. It's every single day I've got somebody in my office saying, oh, this person did this or this person did that. I feel like I'm doing more work than they are. And it, it sounds just like my children at home. But And I tell them that often. You know, you guys need to grow up. <laughs> Professional job here. Okay. Good deal. Uh, Benny and Cindy, what, um, what sort of scriptural principles or verses um, do you sort of put into play in your marriage in regards to love? And I think it's interesting that your relationship necessarily didn't start in the, the, the Christian realm, so to speak. Um, and it wasn't two years later you know, that Benny accepted Christ and all that. So how, what, what principles or verses sort of do you put in there? Well, we probably could go and find several. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I we could probably find a lot of verses in the Bible that that, that uh, the way God and Jesus have taught us to to live and to treat our wife and our spouse and our children. But you know, I, I probably think of uh, uh, the verse in Ezekiel with Jesus, Ephesians. I mean. Where it says the husband treats your wife as, as Jesus loved the church and and give up uh, I think it said give up uh, yourself for her and and I've tried to do that you know um, through the, the littlest thing up to you know treating our children and our grandchildren. Everywhere. And he's very good at it. I had to grow up. He did a really good job of waiting for me, even though he wasn't saved. And I was very, 
religious because I knew the rules. I, I tend to be legalistic because of my background. And so we had a very, very God-centered wedding. And, um, and I mean, everything about it was God-centered. And so um, the thing I really couldn't understand is what went wrong because I just felt like I had messed up. But um, I went to 1 Corinthians where it talks about love being patient, love being kind. And, and instead of asking him to be all those things anymore, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Um, God just really laid on my heart, one, to treat him the way I wanted to be treated, but um, not keeping any records of wrongs because mm. I was real good at that and um, not being easily angered when I didn't get my way because I was real good at being that. And so as God's word began to talk to me, I realized that I felt very strongly for him. But for it to be a godly love, it had to be so much more deeper than just superficial or we weren't going to make it. Hmm. Very good. What uh, what words would you use to describe your marriage today? Fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our kids are grown. They have, you know, <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we never worried about the emptiness, and you know, we we see our children. Matter of fact, we had supper with them last night. It was wonderful. You know. They live their lives and we're so proud of them. You know, they um, are building their families and and it's just exciting to see them grow and, and I know they love the Lord too. So that makes it even better. Good deal. Now, Jeff and Heather, uh, you mentioned you have three kids. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't put you in this spot. Well, that's okay. I mean, Caleb's in here, so. Oh, okay. All right. So if all of us, Caleb is, but if even the other two come up, it's one of them. Yeah. Uh, do you see similarities in, and differences in the homes you grew up in and the home you're trying to build? Um, I brought my Kleenex because I would probably cry. Uh. Um, my childhood was very rough. It was very volatile. My dad was an alcoholic. I get nervous, so I get nervous. It makes me easy. Anyway, <laughs> now I'm fine. Um, I wanted our house to be totally opposite. And I think most of the time it is. I wasn't there when she grew up, but I met her dad. Uh, of course, I, you know, we spent a lot of time with her mom, and, and I've heard a lot of things. You know, she was uh, the oldest of three girls, so she was kind of like a mom in a lot of ways in a single household, you know, a single parent household where her mom was working or, or whatever the case would be. Um, now, you know, personally, I grew up, my, my mom and dad were always there. Um, they, they were good parents. Uh, they do everything perfect, you know, but but very good parents, so uh, both of us had to learn, you take it whenever you're ready, uh, <laughs> you know, both of us, I think, had to learn how to be parents, you know, obviously everybody has to do that, but from her standpoint, it was probably a little more learning curve, huh. you know, because she didn't grow up in that, so, for, oh, so for her to, I don't know, for her to do the things that she does, I think it's awesome. Well, I know we were very fortunate when we met, God had done a lot of things in our life. So our whole relationship, we got a lot of Christian advice. Um, so I was able to try to not listen to things from my childhood or whatever. Um, but like Cindy was talking about saying the word divorce. I mean, my parents said it all the time and we will not use that word in my house even when we're having like the worst fight you could ever have. I mean, I just won't use that word. Because um, it's not an option. And that when we were dating, he actually said to me one time when we were discussing whether or not, um, you no, know, he doesn't necessarily like this, but um, when we were discussing whether or not we were the mate that God had for each other, was, um, you know, he thought that because my mom had been divorced at this moment, um, she had been divorced twice, she's been remarried now on her third marriage, but she's been married for a while now. Um, he thought it would be easier for me to get a divorce because my mom had been divorced and stuff. Um, but there's a safety there that 
I have with him never happened to think of. Awesome. How, how would you describe, what words would you use to describe love in your home? Just just words, one, maybe one or two words. I would say caring. Because amongst all the, not all, I mean, I, you know, even when we fight, even when I get mad at him or whatever, um, or her, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we know we care about each other. Cool. Good deal. Um... Scott and Tammy, how how do you balance leadership and love um, in your jobs? Not always very well sometimes, and this week has been kind of testimony to that for us as a couple, um, balancing our jobs. Um, I think for the most part, you just have to put your priorities. What is what is your first priority, you know, and just make sure that you manage that to a T as much as you can. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Tammy kind of alluded to it. This has been a rough week. Tammy's leading up to the busiest time for her school year, which, if you don't know, is CRCT time. And then um, I'm always kind of busy at work you know like i said i worked yesterday i've been added to an additional team at work because of the work that i do with the team that i currently have they've asked me to step into a team that doesn't have love it's it's glaringly obvious that this team i mean we go to meetings and and these people look at each other like this the whole time i'm just kind of taken aback by that so i think probably time is something that you know we have to express love through time at work and that, that's one of the things I'm trying to build up in this new team is that, okay, I'm willing to spend the time with you, but you're going to have to show me some love and I'm going to show you some love. It's kind of a balancing act there. And how does that, how does that, I just use leadership and love, how does love and discipline uh, work in the, the workplace? And again, I just come back to the fact that you guys are supervisors and, uh, and you know, I just, I know that brings with it a lot of, challenges to uh, well as far as discipline with the students that is every day usually um with the faculty i have had to have some very uncomfortable conversations sometimes um uh, we evaluate teachers as you all know and sometimes you have to point out some things that they can improve on some people are very receptive to that they view that as constructive criticism in a positive way yet others might get defensive you know others might take that and I'm sure then they walk out and you know but as a it's almost like parenting you know with the same with discipline you have to have those uncomfortable conversations you have to sometimes point out things and you know you want that same constructive criticism for you too you know you want that feedback what you could be better at so I think as relationships are super super I mean they're vital in the workforce I think because most people in a workplace if they know you're working as hard for them they will work just as hard for you Um, if you have that relationship of respect back and forth they will take those uncomfortable conversations or those disciplinary situations a lot better than if there's lack of respect or just you know not necessarily they don't like you but they might respect you so 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 the relationship if the relationship is built then both leadership and discipline is received totally different different. than if there's no relationship that's built right very good uh back to benny and cindy last question do you have in your 37 years uh any what i wrote down here as love regrets talking about that this morning and we were we were trying to decide what exactly that question meant but um I would I would marry this man all over again even knowing what we've been through together um because we are who we are today because of everything we've experienced but as far as regret um certainly there is you know you think of things you could have done better you should have known to do better because my background is exactly like Heather's I didn't know that till the day that's amazing um and but I I couldn't know what I didn't know so I as far as regret I can't 
regret something I didn't know. So I just have to allow myself forgiveness for that. But um, as far as things that I did to him or, or things that I said to him um, through the years, um, certainly there are. And um, a lot of times I just think how blessed I am that even when he wasn't a Christian, he was more like Jesus hmm. than I was calling myself a Christian because I had so much growing up to do and so many things to unlearn before I could become a Christian wife to him like every man deserves to have. Hmm. So, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, that goes both ways, you know. I, I, I uh, did a lot of things you know, to the, maybe acting toward the kids differently or things I should have changed and certainly to Cindy that I didn't do at the beginning but once my eyes were open I realized I had to change and I had to treat her better and the kids and it, everybody. You know, I work, you know, people I work with, people on the street, everywhere. You know, just, awesome. And I did regret a lot of it. Of not learning it earlier. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Jeff Heather, any love regrets for you guys? I, I, we were talking yesterday about, um, you know, the verse says he is faithful in the little things. I'll give you more. Um, I was telling the kids that it's not necessarily the big things in life that make someone successful, it, it's all the little things that they do consistently. Hmm. Um, and I think the same way here. I mean, there's there's regrets that, that I have and still have. I mean, because there's things that she needs that I just don't do. Um, little things that I could do. It's not going to take but a minute or two or five or ten minutes. Um, and I just wind up doing my own thing, you know, my own way, uh, which is, you know, selfishness. Um, so that'd be a regret. Hmm. Do the little things a little better. Cool. She didn't have any oh, no regrets at all? <laughs> wow. That's awesome. No, I, I think really just um, losing my temper when I shouldn't or don't need to. So. Okay. Tammy Scott, any love regrets? At um, work, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure we're still at work here. Yeah. Um, kind of just to reiterate, Jeff and Scott both mentioned time. You know, when you both work in supervisory roles, it can consume you. I mean, it can consume 24-7. Um, and just, again, like I said before, prioritizing. And it's just time and making sure that even though we have chosen this path, making sure that we are still the parents that we need to be, that God has called us to be. Um, and just being very mindful of that. Do our kids get neglected sometimes? I'll be honest, yes, I'm sure they do. This week is one of them. They've just kind of been tossed or we've not been home as a family unit. Um, a few mornings this week, I didn't even see my children when they got up. I left. I kissed them goodnight. They were asleep, and I had to be at work before 7 o'clock. And I didn't get home before 7, 8 o'clock. I can't control that this week, but I can control it most weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just the balancing act of making sure that we give them what they need because they didn't choose these roles for us. Which is unrelated to work, but that's okay. Well, it applies. It applies. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. Is that you know both of us being in a leadership role consumes a lot of time, and so you know we constantly are working on how do we balance that time with home life and work life. Um, it's difficult to say I have a regret with love at work. I mean, it's just you know I can think of a couple you know specific instances. As a leader, you do have to walk a very fine line of balance between your relationships that you build at work and make sure that those do not get misconstrued or, or the person you're extending the love to at work doesn't take it the wrong way, especially being a, a man in leadership with women who work for you. you, you know, there's, a, <laughs> there's a fine balance there. So, yeah, there's some regrets that I have over, over my career as a leader just to make sure, you know, there were some times I didn't do that as perfectly as I should have. But other than that, it's more about the time that, you know, we need to balance our life, home life, because that's the more important thing. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate you sharing. Um, and uh, I, th- I think it's neat as God led me who to ask uh, to, to be up there, that He led me to you three and couples. And so I appreciate you being willing to share this morning. Mm-hmm. All right. One of the things that I wanted to do with interviewing them was to literally put skin on what does love mean. Uh, You know, we've read a lot of verses and talked about a lot of things over the last four weeks, but it's different when you hear somebody who says, well, I didn't do it this way, or I wish I would have done it this way, or I wish I would have done that or this. It puts skin on it. And one of the things I hope that we all realize is that none of us are perfect at love. And if you think you're perfect at love, that just shows how arrogant you are to think you're perfect at love because none of us are perfect at love. We all have flaws. Some of those flaws uh, are brought on by our own sin nature that wells within us that we battle with. And there's times when that sin nature leaps up and creeps out and sometimes jumps out of our mouth before we know it. So none of us are perfect at love. We all have flaws when it comes to love. But to put skin on it and to see it and to hear it in the lives of people gives it a different view. And this week I was thinking about, you know, well, after I interview these people, what, what verse could I get? What would put skin on it out of the Bible? And I got to thinking, well, if I want to put skin on it, why not look at what Jesus said? Because the Bible tells us He was what? God in the flesh. He was God with skin on. So I said, well, why not try to find something that Jesus said about love and and use that to put skin on as we close up this series. Listen to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 47. It says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For He gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how different are you from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you if you have a Bible and you read those, my my, my letters are in red, uh, which means indicate that just came right out of Jesus' mouth. And so Jesus is God with skin on, and what does he say to us? He says not to hate your enemies, but to love your enemies. And that's hard to do, isn't it? Yeah, well hey, it's hard to love your enemies. But he tells us to, because, and I think what he does there in that, in that verse that's so powerful, is he says, if you, if you hate your enemies, how different are you than every single person? How, how different are you than anybody else? And as Christians, we walk around, and as Christians, we gather in a place like this on Sunday, and what do we do? We, as Christians, we, we want to claim we're different than the world. We look, there's a power inside of us that's different than the world. There, there's somebody living inside of me that's better than what the world has. That's what we want to do as believers, right? Is it not? And yet he says, if you hate your enemies, you're, you're exactly like the world. You're exactly like everybody else. So one of the things I think Jesus would say to us to, to put skin on this love thing is to love your enemies. Not only the people that are good to you. One of the things, and, and I'm, I'm, Tammy alluded to it in generality, uh, but I just know this story. Uh, several weeks ago, we were having an elders meeting, and, and Scott showed up with the girls, and, and he said, you know, I just had to bring the girls because Tammy was at the hospital visiting a family of one of their kids in the school. That's love. 
she didn't have to go. It wasn't in your job description to go. Your, your clock ended at 5 or 5.30, whatever it was. But then to say, hey, I'm going to go visit this family that has had this horrific car accident, several kids in the hospital, that's love. That's different. Because in maybe the business world, when that happens, you may get a phone call, but usually your boss may not just pop in and show up. So that's love. But then Jesus takes it even further. And in Matthew chapter 22, again, these are red letters straight out of Jesus' mouth. Let me read this, 34. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that He had silenced the Sadducees with His reply, they met together to question Him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap Him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now get this, this is what Jesus replied. This is putting skin on love. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. He says, this is the first and greatest commandment. He said, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Here's what I find interesting about what Jesus says here. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That goes all the way back to, to Old Testament times. That goes all the way back to the beginning. That has never, ever changed. In 2013, guess what? That hasn't changed. What's the greatest thing you can do with your life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Well, what do you need to spend your quiet time focusing on? Love the Lord with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind. What do you need to spend your prayer time to? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. But here's what blew me away this week. He says the second one is equally important. Now can I tell you, I've been a Christian for over 30 years. And I would have never thought the second was equally as important. But he says the second one is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's equally as important. In the eyes of Christ, how you treat your neighbor is how you treat your God. And this week I really tried to give, I was talking with Matt and and the guys Tuesday in our worship planning meeting, and I was really trying to get my head around how can that be equally as important? How, How can it be as important how I treat my neighbor as how I treat my God? How? I just don't get it. And God, God sort of showed me this week. It was progressive. He knows I'm slow. He can't give it all to me at once. So he just, this week progressed it. Here's what, here's what it is. The Bible tells us that as believers, we are the fulfillment and the radiance of Christ. As believers, we we are the Jesus with skin on to the world. As believers, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are the fulfillment of what love is supposed to look like. That's why... It's just as important how I treat my neighbor as how I treat my God. And then he wraps it up there by saying, Every, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two things. You know why it's important not to lie? Because lying is not very loving. You know why it's not, it's not nice to commit adultery against your spouse? Because that's not very loving. You know, I mean, all the Ten Commandments come out of these two commandments. Uh, I mean, you know, that's why you know why you honor the Sabbath because that shows love for your Lord, love for your God. You know why you're supposed to watch the words that come out of your mouth because you're showing love. And so, as we end this series on love, marriage, and other mushy stuff, and we've talked about what love meant, we've talked about marriage. Yes, we talked about sex. Andy Stanley talked about sex. We we we've put skin on it today. Here's what you need to know as we walk out of this series: it is important how you love. You've heard the phrase, "You may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees." It's important how you love.